everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Winter Quarter CDM Research Colloquium series. And uh, for the research seminar today, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Uh, Benjamin Langmead, who is an associate professor in the Department of Computer Science uh, at Johns Hopkins University, Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, Dr. Langmead graduated uh, Phi Beta Kappa and uh, Summa Cum Laude from uh, Columbia University in the city of New York with a bachelor's degree in computer science, uh, uh, MSc and uh, PhD also in computer science from the University of Maryland under the supervision of Dr. Steven Salzberg. Uh, Dr. Langmead's lab applies computational methods uh, such as algorithms, uh, text indexing, cloud computing to create software and resources for life scientists. Langmead's, uh, Dr. Langmead's innovations include uh, developing high impact software tools uh, like Bowtie and uh, Bowtie 2 that address uh, common genomics research questions. Uh, I just wanted to point out uh, Bowtie software uh, was published in 2009 uh, and uh, it has uh, 20,000 citations. And Bowtie 2, uh, which was published in 2012 in Nature Methods Journal, uh, now has 30,000 uh, citations. So they are huge impact uh, software tools. Uh, his lab has also created MyRNA, RailRNA, Kraken, and other uh, scalable software tools that employ the MapReduce parallel programming model and uh, commercial cloud computing services to analyze large-scale uh, collections of archive sequencing data. Uh, Dr. Langmead received both the Alfred P. Sloan uh, Research Fellowship and the prestigious National Science Foundation Career Award in uh, uh, 2014. And in 2016, he was the recipient of the Benjamin uh, Franklin Award for Open Access in Life Sciences for his innovative methods for analyzing high, high throughput biological uh, data sets. Finally, uh, to highlight, highlight the impact of Dr. Langmead's research, in a short period of time, his published work has been uh, cited 69,000 times. Uh, I'm thrilled to have Dr. Langmead uh, at our colloquium to share his research work. Uh, the title of his talk today is uh, Pangenomic Advances for Fighting uh, Reference Bias. Welcome again. Uh, thank you for taking your time uh, to be here today, and uh, please take it away. Great. Thank you. It's my pleasure, and that was a, a very kind introduction. Thank you very much. I think, um, uh, I think, that, I think that was really needed. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, I appreciate it. Um, yes, so thank you very much for having me. I was, as you were speaking, I was just realizing I had written DePaul twice here for no good reason, sorry about that. Um, but today I would like to talk about some recent work that I've, I really enjoy talking about and that I, I enjoy especially talking to computational audiences about because I think it's a, a uh, interesting modern, you know, current example of how theory and practice are starting to progress together uh, very nicely in a important um, question for analyzing sequencing data, which is this question of reference bias. So I'm going to take plenty of time today to describe what reference bias is and what the various pangenomics methods people have been proposing for addressing reference bias, what those are all about as well. Okay, so some theory and some practice today. Okay, so for those here who maybe have or, or maybe you haven't worked with the human genome sequence before, right, a lot of people uh, spend a lot of quality time uh, with the human reference genome sequence. So this is the sequence of, the, of a human genome that we got from the Human Genome Project. And if you go download it, you will find that it's in a file and it's basically a string or it's a collection of strings really because we have one string per, per chromosome. Right, so right away, our computer scientists' minds light up because we like strings and we've been studying them for many years. Um, and so one way that you could view it is you can look at a file that looks like the, the thing on the left. I'm just showing you the header lines from that file, showing you uh, that there are all the different chromosomes in that file. There was, in, uh, there was and perhaps is an exhibit in London at a place called the Wellcome Trust where they literally printed out a version of the human genome sequence in a bunch of volumes, and that's what you see on the right there. Uh, and if you even look in the middle, you can see there's an open book and there's like incredibly dense lowercase a, c, g's and t's printed on every single page of that book. So we've had this sequence for a long time, right? The Human Genome Project wrapped up around 20 years ago, but we've had a consistent complaint about this sequence, multiple complaints. 
Um, the main complaint being it's just one string, right? So one string doesn't necessarily do the job that we need it to do in order to represent um, human beings because there is after all variation among human beings. So the Human Genome Project produced one string. It was really, that doesn't even do a good job of representing what's in one person because after all, we have two copies of our genome, right? Inherited from mother and father, right? So even just one string doesn't fully represent what's in a given individual. Um, but even more dramatic than that, what this one string sort of fails to do is to capture the large amount of population genetics information, information about where genetic variation exists across people that we've been able to collect for many years, both through sequencing, but then also through other genomics technologies like microarrays, which are the things, if you ever use 23andMe, right, they, they use DNA microarrays to, to assess your DNA. So we have all this information, we sort of have a pretty good and increasingly complete picture of how human beings vary from person to person genetically. And the human reference genome, which is sort of the template that we use for all our analyses, when we go to analyze a new sequencing data set, that doesn't have this information, right? It's, it's just sort of like one, it's almost like one sample taken from this uh, very rich high dimensional space that we know a lot about. So for a long time, this has been a sort of complaint um, about the human reference genome. There have been other complaints too, like the fact that it's in pieces, right? It has gaps. And I know that you've already heard, I, I looked at the past speakers, so I know you've already heard from, for example, Mike Schatz and Sergey Korin. So you've already heard about the recent effort to address some of these problems with the uh, human reference genome. But even the project that Sergey spoke about, which was a new effort to sequence the human genome, even that results in, again, just one string, right? It's not, it's not an attempt to be a complete catalog of human genetic variation. It's just trying to be a really good assembly of one person's genome sequence. So, the, so I've uh, criticized the human genome reference sequence for just being a string, but what specifically comes about that's not desirable when we use this individual string as a, as a reference uh, for our analyses? Well, that's contained in this, and th these are, sorry, these are more examples of projects that where we have uh, cataloged and sequenced and assembled new human genome sequences. So there's many, many examples to look at. But the specific problem uh, that we would like to address uh, when, in trying to bring some of this population genetics information into the reference representation has to do with what's called reference bias. Okay, so let me explain a little bit about reference bias. Whenever we analyze a new sequencing data set, our job is essentially to take each uh, little snippet of DNA that comes from that sequencer, so each little snippet of, let's say, your genome sequence, and try to figure out sort of like putting together a puzzle where it matches the reference genome the closest. It's essentially an approximate matching type problem. Where does this short sequence match this long sequence the closest? And wherever it matches the best, that's our best guess as to where we should put it in this process of putting the puzzle back together. However, because the reference genome is just a particular person's genome and because there's variation between, genetic variation between people, this approximate matching algorithm will sometimes have to tolerate differences, right? It'll have to tolerate a mismatch or a gap or some other kind of difference between the reference genome and your genome. And depending on how these differences are distributed throughout your genome, we might be introducing some kind of bias. So like, for example, if one, let's say that your genome happens to match the reference genome in these three places where I've put diamonds here. So like, just imagine that this column of diamonds corresponds to some place in the human genome where there's polymorphism. Some people have one allele, some people have another allele. And so the allele that matches the reference is in blue and the allele that does not match the reference is down here in red. Well, if you happen to match the reference in your genome, then that algorithm that tries to put those reads where they belong, those substrings where they belong, won't have too much trouble because you won't, those blue diamonds match their counterparts in the reference and it doesn't cause any mismatches or gaps. Whereas if you have these red alleles, the ones that are not the ones contained in the reference genome, then the reads may very well go there, but it's harder to figure that out because of the mismatches and gaps caused by the uh, alleles that don't match the reference. Okay, so this general problem uh, 
is called reference bias, right? The things that can go wrong when we try to put sequencing reads, substrings of DNA, where they belong with respect to a reference, the things that can go wrong because the reference just has a particular set of genetic variants and not necessarily some kind of global compendium, inclusive compendium of genetic variants. Okay, so this can be manifested in lots of different uh, analyses that people do all the time in genomics. For example, one thing that people do is they'll sequence the messenger RNAs in a sample. So that's basically this intermediate molecule between a gene and its protein product. So if you see messenger RNAs for a gene, that tells you the gene is turned on. And if you don't see messenger RNAs, then it's probably turned off. It's not producing any protein. So sometimes people like to try to figure out, well, okay, so a gene's turned on, but to what degree is it the copy of the gene coming from the paternal genome versus the copy of the gene coming from the maternal genome producing the messenger RNAs? And that's called allele-specific expression analysis. This is an example of an analysis that's perfectly confounded with the problem that I just outlined, right? Because if one of the two alleles happens to, one of the two copies of the gene happens to contain more alternate alleles, this is sort of a mild case here on the left, but maybe we have a more severe case here on the right. If one of the two copies has more uh, alternate alleles that don't match the reference, then that be it becomes harder to put the reads where they belong when they come from that particular allele. And then our measurement of how highly expressed that copy is, is uh, reduced, right? Basically it suppresses our ability to measure one of the two copies. We sort of get an attenuated signal from that copy. And then it looks like there's a bias but not really. It, it looks like there's a, uh, an allele specific expression pattern, but it's actually just reference bias. And then actually the, the um, first paper I know of that coined this term reference bias and, and mentioned um, and really highlighted this problem, it's actually from a long time ago. It's from now, you know, 12, 13 years ago. Um, and it was identifying the problem in exactly this context, the context of trying to identify allele specific expression. Another place where it has, uh, where reference bias uh, creates problems is in studying hypervariable regions of the genome. So humans have certain portions of their genome, for example, portions of the genome that contain genes that are related to immunity. These portions of the genome can be very different from person to person, right? So whereas two people generally have genomes that are extremely similar, there's certain parts of the genome that you take two unrelated people and their genomes look completely different. You can even take related people and their genomes might look very different in those regions. And so in those regions, the reference bias problem is particularly pronounced. Right? The more differences, the more dramatic the differences between the reference and the individual you're sequencing, the harder it is to use the reference as a good template for putting the, putting the substrings where they belong. So this is an example. This, this is one of those immunity-related regions called MHC or the major histocompatibility complex. And in this area, what this diagram is just showing, there's a sort of peaky trophy shape here, right? Basically, wherever those troughs are, those are places where reference bias is interfering with the um, software's ability to figure out where that where those uh, substrings came from. So we essentially don't get any substrings in some of those areas of the, of the reference genome. Okay, and it's, it manifests in other, in other um, uh, uh, functional genomics assays as well. I might skip this slide, but at any rate, it's, it's also important, for example, if you're trying to find differentially methylated regions, it's another sequencing-based assay where reference bias can actually fool you into thinking that there's something differential happening, but there's not. And furthermore, depending on which genome you use as your reference genome, in this case, these are two different inbred mouse strains. So depending on which inbred mouse strain you use as the reference, you can be fooled in the opposite direction, right? So the direction of the spurious signal can flip. So it becomes quite a nightmare actually in a lot of very practical uh, bioinformatics analyses. So it's certainly a problem that uh, people are trying to tackle. Um, it's even sort of made its way into the popular press. There's been some uh, writing about this. Uh, here's a quote from um, a PBS news, news hour piece that says, by not including diversity, we're missing out on great opportunities to make novel discoveries and to be more inclusive of world populations. Okay, so the very short version of why we wanna attack this problem of reference bias, the problem of the reference genome being 
in some sense, just an arbitrary reference point for our analyses is that we wanna avoid a world where the diagnostics and the therapeutics that we develop are differentially effective by population. We don't want it to be the case that depending on how well your genetics match the genetics of the reference, I'm, I may or may not be able to study you effectively as a, as a patient, for example. So this is why we want to tackle this problem. And the good news is that a combination of bioinformaticians and computer scientists have been on the case uh, for many years. Uh, so this problem has been tackled going many years back. One of the very first conferences I ever went to was a conference where this paper was presented, this, this paper called Genome Mapper. And there have been many, many, many more attempts since then. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit today about this very last one, the R index. But I'm also going to talk about some of these, some of these tools in the middle, like HiSat too. And so I'm going to speak about these uh, approaches generally as belonging in two buckets. So the buckets of approaches that try to take genetic variation and include them in our representation of the reference, basically by taking the string reference genome and turning it into a graph-shaped reference genome. So a reference genome that can have forks in the road. You can have choices um, of different alleles that are present in the population. And then I'll switch at the end to talking about a different way of thinking of things where instead of indexing a single genome, we're indexing a collection of genomes for which there is a lot of internal repetition, right? So sort of the problem, I'll switch to thinking of the problem of how do you index a repetitive collection of genome sequences and I'll try to talk to some of the pros and cons of these two ways of, of tackling the problem. So as I move into that discussion, let me start with, um, and, and this is an illustration of, uh, of the first of the two sort of buckets that I'm going to address, which is the graph genome bucket, right? So this, this illustration, which is taken from the, the VG paper, VG is the name of an aligner that uses a graph genome representation. Um, it's trying to show you the basic idea of the graph, which is that some parts of the graph have non-variable sequences, right? Everybody basically has the same sequence in this part of the genome, but then we get to a part of the graph where some people have one allele and some people have a different allele, and we have kind of a choice to make, right? We can sort of navigate different paths through that graph, and different paths correspond to different individuals that have been studied. Okay. So, in talking about these different approaches for uh, uh, representing more than one genome in the reference genome, uh, I want to make a distinction because I think this distinction helps to um, differentiate between the strengths and weaknesses of these different approaches. There's two basic reasons that are somewhat in tension with each other for why we might want to represent many genomes together in a pan genome. One reason is because we're trying to create essentially a catalog. We're trying to basically come up with a data structure where if we put all the different things we know about genetic variation into that data structure, then we're storing them all in a reasonable coordinate system so that we can ask questions later, like, okay, here are two different uh, variants. Are they basically two different versions of the same variant? Are they in the same gene? Are they near each other? Do they ever co-occur on a particular person, right? These are all sorts of questions that we can start to answer if we've put all the variation into a nice, common, maybe graph-shaped um, sort of data structure. So that's one reason why we might want to build a pan genome. But another reason we might want to do so is because what we're looking for is more like a map. Like we want to be able to answer questions about, just like we saw before, where do these substrings belong with respect to the larger sequence? And so here, the purpose of including more excuse me, more variation in the reference representation is to get a better answer to the question of where does a certain substring best match the larger collection of strings in our pan genome. And it turns out that um, one of the uh, important points that distinguishes these two uh, reasons for, for building a pan genome is the question of whether more is necessarily better. So uh, when the question is more better seems to perhaps have a different answer depending on whether what we're building is a catalog or a map. 
If we're building a catalog, a big part of the purpose of doing that is inclusiveness. We want to get as much variation in there as possible so we can ask questions about it later. But is it also a good idea if, we're want, to, if we want to use this representation as a map, is more variation always better? This was a question that we asked with some research we did a few years ago. And we looked at one of these um, uh, tools, one of these read aligners. This is a tool that tries to put the small snippets of DNA where they belong with respect to a larger reference. And we took one of these tools that's uh, able to use a graph representation of the pan genome. And we asked, does this tool do a better job as we add more genetic variation to the graph, basically? Or does it perhaps do worse? Or does it perhaps like hit a peak and then do worse? Right? We, it hadn't really been measured. We were just so busy putting more variation in the graphs that it was sort of time to stop and think about whether we were improving things by putting more variation in the graph. So we did a series of experiments. Um, these were simulation experiments uh, so that we could, for every little snippet of DNA, get the sort of true answer as to whether we had put that snippet in the right place or not. And we built more and more inclusive, as we go to the right in the plot, I'm not showing it yet, I'll show it in a moment, but as we go to the right in this plot, we're basically building more and more inclusive and bigger graph representations that include more and more genetic variation as we go to the right. And then on the vertical axis, I'm just gonna plot one way that we can measure how good the answers are that are coming out of the read aligner. Basically, what fraction of the time is it able to align a short snippet of DNA correctly with respect to the longer uh, reference genome. And we weren't sure what we were going to find, right? Like maybe we were going to find, for example, a strictly increasing trend here as we go to the right, or maybe we were going to see something more like a peak followed by a decline. We weren't sure. And this is basically what we found. So you could ignore the dotted lines for a moment. And in fact, maybe just concentrate on that solid red line. That's the most important one uh, for today. So the one that I'm sort of tracing here. And you can see it very much does have that second shape that I was describing where it has a peak and then it goes down. And so what we're seeing here is that as we add more and more genetic variation to the reference graph representation, and here we're doing it in priority order from the most to the least frequent uh, alleles, right? So in other words, if some allele is present in 99% of people, it gets high priority. But if some allele is present in 2% of people, it gets low priority. Um, so as we add those genetic variants with, uh, you know, in priority order, cumulatively to the graph representation, we for a while see improvements until we get to this, you know, this peak here, which is at I believe if I remember correctly, it's around 8% of the genetic variants in our database, which was the thousand genomes project uh, call set. So once we get to around 8% of variants, we reach a peak. And then as we add more variants, the accuracy of the aligner actually goes down. All right, so was this surprising? Well, I think it's not so surprising to see that it goes up at the beginning. And further, I would say it's not so surprising either to see it go down toward the right. So the reason why it goes up is because as we add more and more of these common genetic variants to the representation, we're essentially taking away those penalties that are incurred by mismatches and gaps because you know, we've included it in the graph. And when it's included in the graph, it matches the read and we don't have to incur a penalty for that difference, right? So we essentially took away penalties strategically and that was good at first. And then after a while, we started adding genetic variants that were less common. They were less likely to be present in the individual that we simulated the reads from. And so eventually adding these alternative uh, paths through the graph started to hurt us because it's making the entire graph representation more ambiguous. Basically every new genetic variant we add is taking away a penalty that maybe should have been there, right? You know, the we want to take away the penalties associated with the alleles that are in our individual we're studying, but we don't want to take away the penalties from the alleles that are not in the individual that we're studying. And eventually that's what we're doing. And so the representation is only becoming more ambiguous. One more thing I want to point out here, I want to point out this point that's up here. That point up there corresponds to a um, 
what would happen if we made our graph, our reference representation, out of just the genetic variants that were actually present in the individual we simulated from, right? It's in some sense, this is like an idealized reference representation where we had perfect foreknowledge of exactly what variants were in this individual. And what's interesting is, yes, it does better in terms of accuracy than any of the graphs that we measured, but this graph, the sort of peak one, the one that had peak accuracy got pretty close to that point, right? It didn't make it there, but it got like, I don't know, three quarters of the way to where that purple point is representing in some sense, as good as we could possibly expect to do, like as good as we, as well as we could do with perfect foreknowledge of what genetic variants that individual has. So first of all, it was very interesting to see that we had to be selective in order to get good performance, that it would not be a good idea to just put all the genetic variation in at once. But on the other hand, it was also very interesting that we got pretty close to what would be, what could be, uh, what could be thought of as the ideal, the ideal performance uh, of any reference representation. So besides just looking at this accuracy measure, we also looked at a measure of bias, right? That same bias that I was, that I was describing before. So we just calculated one aggregate measure of basically how biased we tended to be against the alternate allele at all of the places in the genome where the individual was heterozygous. In other words, they had one of each. They had the reference allele from one parent and the alternate allele from the other parent. If we are free of reference bias, then we should see perfect 50-50 representation of those two alleles. If we have a even a little bit of reference bias, then we'll see a tendency, a shift toward the reference allele because we'll fail to align some of the reads that contain the alternate allele. And so what we see here is there is a shift. It's, it's not incredibly easy to see, but I'll, I'll try to draw the zero line there so that you can see for all these percentages, there's a slight shift toward the reference allele. It's only when we get to including 10% of variance that we see a more ideal 50-50 split between the two alleles, right? So again, adding genetic variance to the graph representation eventually does in the aggregate address the reference bias problem, but we only need something like 10% of the variation from the database to get to 50-50 representation. After that point, the benefit saturates. Right? Okay, so what did we learn from these experiments? Uh, we said that we can be selective in terms of what genetic variants we include in the pangenome graph, and that in doing so, we can kind of balance the pros and cons, right? If we select the alleles cleverly or, or with at least some uh, uh, discrimination where we wanna take the more common ones, for example, rather than the less common ones, if we can be at least somewhat selective, then we can maybe balance the pros and cons of having a graph genome representation that gets more ambiguous at the same time as it takes away uh, spurious uh, penalties from the alignments. We found even a modest number of variants, right, just 8 to 10 percent or so of the variation from the 1000 Genomes Project was enough to alleviate the bias and improve um, alignment accuracy. And then we found peak accuracy was at something like 8 to 10 percent of variants which corresponds to an allele frequency cutoff of about greater than or equal to 5%. In other words, that genome that did the best was the one that included all the genetic variants that were in at least one out of 20 people that, who, were, who were measured in those previous projects. So what we found in this study, um, you know, we're, we're not alone. You know, another study came along later that found something similar when studying different uh, cow, different cattle genomes from different inbred strains of cattle, different strains of cattle, species of cattle. Um, and then similarly, there's been some follow on computational work to come up with even, uh, uh, even smarter ways of prioritizing which variants you ought to include in, in pan genome graphs. And so this has become a, a, a common way of thinking about the uh, pros and cons of building a graph representation of a pan genome. We were pretty, uh, uh, struck by just what a relatively small percentage of variants were sufficient to get sort of like peak accuracy out of these pan genome graphs. And as a result, what we wanted to try next was to see if a very simple approach 
that used a relatively small number of linear reference genomes might be able to do just about as well as some of these much more sophisticated approaches that use graphs. And so this was our next thought is, okay, well, what if we just had a handful? What, what if we had a small budget of uh, linear reference genome representations that we could store and we wanted to see if we could compete with some of these more complicated graph-based pan-genome methods? So here's what we tried next. And uh, we actually are using Bowtie 2 in, the, in these experiments, so mentioned in the introduction. So we like to use our own tools. So here we, we decided to use Bowtie 2. And our thought was this, we could do things in sort of a uh, two, in, in a set of two passes. So we said, okay, for, for all these snippets of DNA, all these sequencing reads, let's first do the normal thing that everybody does first, which is let's align them to the reference genome. GRCH38 is the name of our sort of standard reference genome. So let's align all the reads there first. And then let's take the alignments that come out and basically ask, do they look good or not? Right? So did they align uniquely with a high uh, alignment score and a high mapping quality, which is our sort of measure of whether the aligner is pretty sure or not in its answer. So if the aligner seems pretty sure it got the right answer, then we say, okay, I'll keep that alignment. But if the aligner seems at all unsure about its answer, then we're gonna try again and again and again and again to align that same read five more times, but to five separate population specific, or more accurately, I should say, super population specific reference genomes. So these five boxes you see on the right here correspond to five broad genetic groupings as defined by the Thousand Genomes Project. So European, African, East Asian, South Asian, and then admixed American. Those are those five groups. Uh, so every read that failed to align very well to GRCH38 would get aligned to each of these five superpopulation specific genomes. And then essentially we take the best. Right, so we, we, we now, for those reads that we aligned to those five genomes, we now have a total of six choices for what we think is the best alignment for that read. And we look, we look at all of them and take the best. And when I say best, I mean the one that had the fewest differences with respect to the genome that it aligned to. Really, we use a notion of alignment score so that there is a kind of scoring scheme for different kinds of differences that we might observe. And we just take the highest scoring. Um, a, a, a detail, but an important detail is that because all these reference, these uh, uh, five reference genomes that I'm showing in the second pass here, the population, the superpopulation specific ones, because they can have slight differences in reference coordinates, they can have insertions and deletions with respect to the reference. That means they're in a somewhat different coordinate system, right? They don't line up perfectly with the with the genome that we're ultimately. Uh, reporting results in. So we might have to do a little bit of extra computation to translate the coordinates back into the coordinates used in GRCH38. And that's why we need this, this step that's referred to as lifting down here in this box. So that final lift is just getting them back into the expected coordinate system. Now, because we're only doing, we're only working here with a handful of linear reference genomes, we're sort of free to use whatever tool and whatever index we want. And so here's where we use sort of our favorite linear standard, not graph-based, but widely used read aligner called Bowtie 2. So we just use Bowtie 2, we build a Bowtie 2 index of all those genomes. You might be concerned that we seem to be doing a lot of work here because we're aligning as many as six times. You know, We're aligning each read as many as six times in this scheme. But fortunately for us, in practice, it turns out most reads take the, the short path, right? Most reads get aligned once and the aligner is pretty competent and we don't revisit that read. It's usually, and this is a very rough approximation because it's very data set dependent, but it's usually roughly a fifth of the reads that need to go along the slower path where they get aligned to all five of those second pass genomes. So we don't, we're not blowing up the speed by a factor of six or, or you know, blowing up the time required by a factor of six. It's something much closer to a factor of two and it's usually even less than a factor of two. So it's not actually an enormous time overhead to do what we're suggesting here. So having implemented that, we then compared it to many other tools. Uh, we've got a variety of tools here. This is just standard alignment to the standard reference. This is what if we just massage the reference a little bit so that it has the major alleles at every position. This is a 
a formidable competitor, this tool VG, which is a very good graph alignment based tool. And then these are two different versions of the approach that I just outlined. And then this, again, we have this personalized genome. That was the one that corresponded to that purple point that I showed before. It's in some sense, the best we could possibly do. And so higher on this plot is higher alignment accuracy, similar to the previous plot that I showed. And so the approaches that are doing the best are um, you know, the personalized genome, of course, because that's ideal, but then also our reference flow-based approach, which in terms of alignment accuracy is doing even better than this, than this sort of uh, very well-known graph-based approach. If we turn now to look at reference bias, right, which was the uh, second plot that I showed before, it's a slightly different story, right? So this line here corresponds to perfectly even representation of reference and alternate alleles at the heterozygous sites. So being right on this line is ideal and not surprisingly, the personalized genome reference is right there on the ideal line. But if we look here, we see our approach there on the left and it's maybe lagging somewhat behind the VG approach there right next to it, right? So we do in fact, greatly reduce the amount of reference bias relative to the standard approach, which is all the way up here, but we don't do quite as well as this graph-based approach VG. So it was uh, uh, heartening to us though, how close we were able to get with this very simple linear alignment-based approach that only used a total of six reference genomes. Okay, nearly as much avoidance of bias compared to VG. So what did we learn from this effort? Well, we learned that aligning to multiple linear reference genomes, even just a total of maybe six of them, uh, as long as they're selected to cover the sort of space of possible genotypes, right, the different superpopulations that we used in that second pass, we can achieve similar accuracy and bias compared to a more complex graph aligner like VG, but at a fraction of the time and memory footprint. So we were at, we used about 18% of the time and 14% of the memory footprint just by using a standard linear uh, read alignment tool. And that this all could be implemented with essentially a simple wrapper script around that existing alignment tool. However, there was a big, um, the, the sort of slight difference that I showed in this picture, right? The slight difference uh, here sort of pointed to a bigger issue, which is that in our small number of reference genomes that we're representing in this approach, we're not covering the space of genotypes very well at all, right? For example, even a relatively common allele, let's say an allele at 10% allele frequency in the population is probably not in any of the six genomes that we're using in our, in our pipeline, right? So we're not getting very good coverage of the sort of full space of genetic variation. We're getting in some sense, just enough to do the job, um, but, we were very intrigued by the idea of, well, what if we could, like, what if we could get all, what if we could stay linear and use linear reference genomes, but try to get a much larger amount of genetic variation to be somehow contained in our reference genome representation. So that sort of motivated where we went next. And I'm now going to pivot from the sort of graph-based approaches back to the sort of string-based approaches. And, but I want to conclude by saying the graph-based approaches have sort of got a nice, that whole world has a nice theoretical, um, uh, has been sort of summed up theoretically in a very nice way relatively recently. Because there've been a lot of, there's been a lot of work on how to index graphs that work, uh, you know, sometimes people were applying it to uh, DAGs in general. Sometimes people were applying it to trees. Sometimes people were applying it to certain restricted kinds of graphs. But the theory of exactly what kind of graphs are easy to index got a big boost by this paper here, which defined the notion of a Wheeler graph, also called a Wheeler automaton, which is, uh, seems to be a very workable and good notion for what are the things that are easy to index that are graph shaped. So that's, I just wanted to put that on the screen because that's a nice theoretical contribution that's been sort of uh, spurring a lot of the recent work in this graph-based pangenome world. Um, so now I want to pivot to talk more about, uh, about genomes, uh, reference genome representations that use strings. And for that, I'll just want to give a little bit more background because I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, the burroughs wheeler transform a little bit, which is at the core of a lot of the very commonly used read alignment tools in the field.
right? So the tools that are used today for solving this same problem I've been talking about this whole time of trying to figure out where short sequences come from with respect to longer reference genomes, pretty much all the most popular tools use a particular kind of text index to represent the reference genome, and it's called the FM index. And it is a slight variation on the idea of the Burroughs-Wheeler transform. The Burroughs-Wheeler transform has been around for a long time, and it's been used especially for compression. So if you've ever used the BZIP2 tool to compress a file, right? Okay, it's not the most popular tool, but if you've ever used it, that's based on the Burroughs-Wheeler transform. A lot of other compression approaches are based on the Burroughs-Wheeler transform. And the basic idea behind the transform is that if we take a string, so my, like my string T here, which you, you can think of as perhaps like a very short genome, and you form a matrix out of all the distinct ways of doing a cyclic rotation of that string, and then you sort that matrix alphabetically, and you take the final column of that matrix, you get something called the Burroughs-Wheeler transform. And the Burroughs-Wheeler, another way of thinking about what we did here is we took the characters in the original string and we permuted them according to the alphabetical order of their right contexts, the alphabetical order of what came to the right within the original string. So it's really just a permutation of the characters in a string, but what it tends to do if the string is very repetitive, if the string has lots of repeated substrings in it, then what the Burroughs-Wheeler transform tends to do is it tends to bring like characters together into runs in the Burroughs-Wheeler transform string. Same character runs, so the same character over and over again. Let me give an example. So let's say our text is this text here, which is clearly repetitive, right? I've got a variation on the word uh, rectangle a few times here. If we take that text, and we put that through the Burroughs-Wheeler transform, that's gonna permute it, and the permuted text is gonna look like this. And those three occurrences of that substring ectang, 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 all being very similar to each other, it means that the thing that came just to the left, the Rs, that came just to the left of those substrings came and sat right next to each other in the permuted string. Right, this is the kind of thing that the Burroughs-Wheeler transform does, and this is why it's useful for compression, because you can imagine if you apply this transform to something that's repetitive and redundant, and then you collapse these runs using, say, run length encoding, then you've, you've compressed the original string. Okay, and so this, this idea becomes very important potentially for genomics. Let me just show a few more examples of the Burroughs-Wheeler transform doing its thing. So let me just show a few separate strings where we've applied the transform. So here's an original string, very repetitive. Right? This is supposed to be a very repetitive one. And then we apply the Burroughs-Wheeler transform and oh, look at that nice long runs, right? So like a nice long run of six Rs right there, for example. And so the average run length in the transformed version is much longer than the average run length in the original. And so it's much more amenable to being compressed. Okay, and if we come up with somewhat less repetitive strings, well, the effect is somewhat reduced. But when it comes to genomes, collections of genomes, like uh, say 10 people's genomes, let's say we take 10 people's genomes and concatenate them together, what you get is extremely repetitive, right? Because two human genomes are actually extremely similar to each other. There's something like 99.8% similar by sequence. So collections of human genomes are more like the first example. In fact, they're even better than that first example in terms of how repetitive they are. And indeed, if you just do an experiment where you take a bunch of assembled human genome sequences and apply the Burroughs-Wheeler transform and then count, this is what the R column is, is, represents, count how many runs there are in the Burroughs-Wheeler transformed string, what you find is that the number of runs is way smaller than the number of characters, right? In other words, there's so much redundancy among the copies of these genomes that adding one more genome just makes a bunch of runs longer. It doesn't actually add any new runs to the Burroughs-Wheeler transformed representation. And so whereas if we add more and more genomes, the total length and the total length is getting larger linearly, R, the number of Burroughs-Wheeler runs, is getting larger much slower than that, right? It's very sublinearly uh, with respect to the number of genomes being added, right? So the long and the short of it is as N goes up, as the number of genomes goes up, 
the number of runs only goes up proportional to the amount of new distinct sequence in each new genome, not the total amount of sequence in each new genome. So if we can get pan-genome representations and indexes that sort of uh, where the size depends on R, right, the number of runs in the burroughs wheeler transform, but don't depend on N, the total length of the genomes that are being indexed, then we're doing a great job because R is not going to grow very quickly as we add more genomes to this representation. So there's been a lot of literature on this question of how much can we do while staying under this kind of big O of R as opposed to big O of N upper bound. And just to put it very briefly, there was the original FM index paper where you had to pay O of N, O of N for everything. There was a paper in 2005 that for one kind of query was able to improve the space bound to big O of R, that's what we're looking for. But unfortunately it was not able to accomplish that for a different important query. Then many years went by. And finally we got a paper just a couple years ago that was able to accomplish this for both of the key queries. And now that we can accomplish this for both, we really can build pan genome indexes that aren't graphs Right, they're actually just concatenations of strings, but the size of the index only goes up with the amount of distinct sequence in those strings. And this is a very new thing. And we're really only starting to wrap our heads around what's now possible in pangenomics given these new approaches. So uh, I have 10 more minutes, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna show at least a couple of examples of how we've already applied this. And, and then I can uh, uh, wrap up uh, really quickly. Okay, so this is now I'm going to refer to work that um, I was part of some of this work, but this is the team uh, that really did a lot of it. You know, I especially want to tip the hat to Christina Boucher and Travis Gage, who are uh, collaborators of mine and who brought me in on these projects, and um, we still work together on a lot of these same problems. So Christina is at University of Florida and Travis is at University of Dalhousie in Halifax. All right, so in one effort, we wanted to show that if we build uh, this kind of index, it's called an R index, where all of the components of the data structure grow with R as opposed to N. If we build one of these R index data structures over larger and larger collections of genome sequences, we wanted to show that the space required by those data structures was growing much slower than what other tools would require, right? For example, tools that are based on the more classic FM index that really does grow with N as opposed to with R. And that is what we see. And that's why we see, for example, this green line eventually uh, getting, or sorry, the green line is actually the, not the uh, classic approach, right? So this green line that uses the classic approach is eventually getting to the point where it's far, it's building far larger indexes than any of these approaches that are using a compressed index, including the R index. And indeed, after a certain point, Bowtie, right? My tool, I'm criticizing my tool here, uh, just crashes, right? It just runs out of memory and it can't build indexes for any collection larger than that. Whereas the R index is able to plow along and continue to build more, bigger and bigger indexes. This was a similar uh, uh, evaluation, but where we're evaluating the amount of time required to answer a locate query. In other words, if you go to look for a pattern inside the reference database and you find it, and now you wanna know where did you find it? Where was the offset where it occurred? That's a locate query. And if you perform locate queries on larger and larger indexes consisting of more and more copies of uh, a reference genome, then eventually, Bowtie, which is extremely sort of highly tuned for this task, slows is slower than its competitor than the R index competitor, and indeed, again, it can't even handle references that are larger than that. Right, so eventually, R index is able to win that battle as well. And then, most importantly, what we found was what we were able to index with the R index collections of full human genome sequences. Right, so as you can probably appreciate from the fact that you've heard from, for example, Sergey Korin, who talked about the T to T effort, there are more and more examples of new human genome reference uh, sequences that have been assembled from scratch, but that are very high quality. And so we wanted to take a collection of those and see, could we, could we build indexes of larger and larger sets of these human genome 
assemblies. And that's what we see here in this top line. So we're able to do it. And not only that, but importantly, uh, the size of the index here, we're actually measuring the peak memory footprint of the index building process. It's increasing sublinearly, right? As we anticipated, right? As you add more reference genomes, the, the uh, memory footprint should grow sublinearly, not linearly. And same thing if we construct those reference genomes, not from whole genome assemblies, but from essentially uh, panels of genotyped individuals from the Thousand Genomes Project. The green line is actually more realistic because it inclu it's inclusive of all the structural variation in all those genome assemblies, whereas the red line is a little bit more biased towards small variants. So this was very exciting. It's, it's a result we're continuing to work on. We'd like not just to be able to index like eight or 10 human reference genome assemblies, but maybe hundreds and thousands. We don't have that many yet, so we can't really do that experiment yet. Um, but the important part here is the sublinear growth. So this is what gives us hope that we're gonna be able to continue in this direction in the future. I'll quickly mention two, um, two papers that were highlighted in different parts of the RECOM conference last year. Um, uh, let me actually just stick to the one on the right-hand side, the one called Spumoni. This is an example where we're taking the R-index framework and applying it to a pretty specific problem, which is the problem of selective DNA sequencing using nanopore sequencers. You probably heard again from both Mike Schatz and Sergey Korn about nanopore sequencing. It's, and in fact, Mike Schatz told you, I'm sure about Uncalled, which is their a uh, tool for doing selective ejection of nanopore reads from nanopores in real time. So Spumoni is our tool for doing something very similar to that. And in fact, Mike Schatz is a co-author on that study as well, except here we're using the R index to index the collection of genomes corresponding to what it is we'd like to capture or perhaps eject from those pores, right? So if our database of things we're looking for is very repetitive, then the R index is perfect because it's gonna build a nice small index but we can still do uh, things quickly enough to be able to eject uh, reads from nanopores in real time. So that's what that work on the right is about. Okay, so uh, uh, now to conclude. Um, so first of all, uh, I like to emphasize, uh, there's a lot of wonderful pangenomics work, but I think that some of the pangenomics work could benefit from a little bit more focus on what problem is the pangenome trying to solve? And I think if the pan genome is trying to solve the reference bias problem, then it's much it's it's important to realize that we're talking about using a pan genome as a map rather than as a catalog. If we use it as a catalog, more is always better. But if we use it as a map, more is not necessarily better, and we have to be selective about what to include in the catalog. Um, I also uh, hope you'll take away that when used with more than one linear reference, that linear aligners, including sort of classic everyday, uh, widely used and, and decade old uh, read aligners like Bowtie 2, can avoid reference bias to a degree similar to how the more complicated graph alignment approaches can avoid it, right? So as long as you give them a certain amount, a reasonable amount of coverage of the space of possible genotypes, the linear aligners can compete with the graph aligners on avoidance of reference bias. A final point I want to get to, and this is actually well supported um, from the previous talks you saw, right? We have these new approaches, these new genome assembly uh, uh, efforts like the telomere to telomere sequencing consortium, and we're going to get more of these, right? We're going to get more of these brand new assembled from scratch, but very high quality human genome sequences. And in order, to, in order to use those in combination with a graph aligner, you have to put them in the same coordinate system with each other first. And there's really no existing good approach to do that. And it's possible that there never will be an, a really good approach to do that because human beings actually have a fair amount of sort of coordinate, coordinate busting, coordinate defying uh, structural variation with respect to each other. And so it's really hard to put them in the same coordinates. And so we're going to need for some of the pangenomic approaches that we adopt going forward, at least some of them, to not try that, <laughs> you know, to not try to put them in common coordinates, but to let them be separate linear genomes, but nonetheless index them all together. And that's the main thing I think the R index approach is going to uh, contribute to the field. Okay, so as a final sort of zoomed out slide, um, 
pan genomics, I think, is a is a particularly fun field to be in right now because the theoretical advances, like the ones that led to the FM index and more recently to the R index, are moving forward in a way that's very tied to what the genomics field actually needs needs from them. <laughs> right. So we're it, it's a particularly rich interplay right now between theory and practice uh, in this pan genomics field. And this is particularly well represented by these two recent papers that I referenced, one being the Wheeler graph paper that I showed earlier, but then the more recent one being the R index paper that achieved the big O of R bounds. Um, those are basically now, those two papers are give strong theoretical underpinnings to both extremes of this trade-off space of graph versus linear, right? So they're both moving forward, but they're both well grounded in recent computer science theory. And then finally, if you're interested in learning more about uh, these indexing topics, I have a playlist that comes from the second half of the class that I teach each spring. Uh, so you can check that out on YouTube if you are interested. So with that, thanks uh, very much for listening and thanks to the whole team pictured here. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions.